everyone. We're back. It's only been a year. Been a year. What, you, what have you been doing? I haven't seen you in so long. Well, as you can see, I've been enjoying the Ginny Lee Cafe <laughs> cooking uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I heard that's a problem with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially this past year. Uh, any excuse to stay inside and you know catch up on Netflix a little bit. Yeah, you didn't uh, need an excuse. <laughs> there was no place to go. Exactly, exactly. Well, folks, Welcome back. My name is Alex Jankowski. I am joined by the one and only Mr. John Poulos. And a couple reasons we decided to come live to you here inside of Wagner Vineyards. Uh, one of which is a uh, humble celebration, if you will, or humble anniversary uh, from when we, we were shut down for tastings for three months last year, which feels like maybe about 10 years ago, but it was only a year ago. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to come and talk a little bit about what this past year has been like. Uh, in that past year, as we uh, teased many times during our, our myriad of live chats, uh, Mr. John Poulos here wrote a book, and we are going to talk all about that. Now, I do want to just get a quick audio check out there. Folks can let us know in the comments if you are able to hear us. Uh, that would be great. Uh, if not, we'll continue to, to, to monitor that and work with that. But uh, before, we, before we get into the book, Mr. Poulos, how has this past year been for you? Well, it's been, at 73 years old, it's been interesting. It's been to, a year. To, to <laughs> say the least. You know, we were here, uh, you know, we still have our mask, and, uh, which are required, of course. And uh, uh, we had the hand stuff on the, on the table last year, and, and we're just figuring out how to do all of this. Right. Um, and so for three months, we did nothing but sell wine on the internet. Right. And a lot of wine on the internet. Yes. Thank you to you fellow Thank you all of folks you. on the internet for, yeah. for doing that. And we, we've run out of wines here that we've never run out of wine before. Uh, so that was, that was good for, for Wagner's. Um, and we kept busy, uh, here. The Wagner's were, um, more than gracious, the family, to keep all the full-time staff on, exactly. um, finding things for us to do and cleaning. And, and they were very good to me because uh, I did a few internet projects for them, but I was working on my book, which right. is all about Wagner Wine. Yes. Uh, then we opened up, I believe, on June 18th mm -hmm. uh, with plexiglass. Uh, people tell us, uh, we, I think, I think, uh, Alex, um, we did 60,000 people between June 18th and the end of November. And that's more than we did in 2019. But our tastings are limited. You have to have a reservation. We do it behind plexiglass. Um, I might have 10, 11 groups around my bar. Mm -hmm. Now I have two, and they're separated uh, by plexiglass. Uh, we follow all the rules. We pour into a separate glass into a shot glass, the customer pours into their wine glass, the wine glass does not get near me, uh, and we're doing everything that uh, the CDC and Cornell and everybody recommended to us, and I've had many, 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 many people tell me that they, they think this is the safest place they come to. Yeah, and that, that's been echoed to me as well, which is, which is great to hear. Um, we really appreciate the feedback that we did have, and, and if we had to make tweaks, we did. But I am curious, you know, from your perspective, how that is for somebody on the tasting staff side of things where, okay, uh, you know, you have to wear a mask the whole day, which is difficult, you know, you may be not able to interact as much, but you do have, as you mentioned, a much more manageable crowd, and, a, and I think a more captivated crowd, um, folks who are coming to really right. learn about the wine. Alex, um, in the old days, pre-COVID, if that's the old normal, like I said, I could have a bar full of people, uh, could have two, four, two, four, three, six that are on my bar. Some of the people would be on their first tasting, some would be on their third, some would be on their fourth. We give five, five samples. Somebody else would come in. And as I worked around the bar and people are waiting, now I have two groups. And they scheduled me on the hour. Mm -hmm. I'm spending 45, 50 minutes if I don't have to have a reservation. Saturdays are pretty booked, Sundays are pretty booked, but during the week I can spend an hour and a half with someone, mm -hmm. and I can go through a lot of our different wines. And that's that's a short tasting. Too, yeah, and that's right? a short. That, that's, that's a short. That's a small yeah, seminar. Laughing. That's a, a, a lot. <laughs> but we're finding that we're selling more wine when that happens. 
Correct. Uh, we're selling a lot of wine because mm -hmm. people, um, I will pour and explain, um, you know, the history, it's all in the book. We talked about it last fall, the history of red wine, but uh, uh, I'm finding they're buying more wine and they're more captivated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope, I'd like to see the plexiglass come down. You know, the people seated don't have to wear um, a mask. I wear a mask. Um, and I'd like to see that come off eventually, and it will. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see us do the same thing that we're doing. I'd like mm -hmm. to see the reservation system mm -hmm. uh, or just two to three groups at a time that they come in. See, they come in together. And you've seen me. I'm a former school teacher. Right. And if I see that the two groups are drinking similar, then I hold class. Yes. And, and <laughs> I just step back. Roll is taken. And we just, we just hold class. And they drink what I tell them to. Yeah. And so that's, and I love that. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's. Well, to that end, uh, Stephanie Berlay mentioning, you know, we were lucky enough to have John for a tasting in September. He made a great impression, which, uh, you know, is always great to hear. Len Thompson shouting out the nice plaid. Great to see. Gotta love plaid on a day like today. We had snow <laughs> for snow. two days two in days. a row. Uh, my two days off, it snowed yeah. both days. <laughs> Last week I'm working in the gardens <laughs> on my hands and knees. And, and this week comes in a room. Yesterday, I'm, I live in Skinny Atlas now. I'm shoveling snow. Yeah. So, okay. uh, beautiful day today, though. We thank everybody who is, who is um, holding off going outside, or maybe you are outside and watching this uh, and joining us. Please let us know. It sounds like the audio is fine, which is great. Uh, Patricia Blair read his book or read his book. I'm not sure, you know, maybe mm -hmm. she read the book and is telling everyone to read the book, which is great advice. Tell us also what you guys are drinking tonight. We have uh, 2020 Dry Rosé. We felt it was, uh, it was significant to pour a wine from, from 2020 given, you know, what this past year was like. And we'll, we'll get into the vintage and we'll talk about this wine in particular a little bit later on. But, but, but let's talk about this book here which I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of taking the, the Regis role here. You know, you're on, this is the first stop on your book tour, looking at wine <laughs> yeah, the through one, the a one, different the, window. The one-stop book tour. <laughs> All right, well, I got to be Regis, then I got to be Oprah, <laughs> okay. I got to be everybody The one-stop book um, tour. And, <laughs> oh, do we got this here? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, yeah, so looking at wine through a different window, uh, it is available on our website. It's available right here in the store as well. Um, you know, we do, we do ask, you know, everybody shop local, you know, buy it straight from our website. That price, uh, shipping is included, so it ships for free after that. Uh, but let's, let's back it up a little bit here. The impetus to write a book, the inspiration to write a book. I mean, you have, you have a, a book plus worth of knowledge going on in your brain. What, when, what was the decision, when All did right. the decision come to put right. pen to paper? We're around books from the time we're a little kid, your parents are reading books to you. Mm -hmm. That still goes on today. I have a little quasi-grandson. I'll tell you a little bit more about, about him later. But his parents read to him every night. My parents read to me. You go to school and you're issued books. You sign for your books. You cover your books. Books are part of your life. Not every aspect of what we had. Some people don't drink. They're, they're not wine drinkers. Some people don't drink. Some people drink nothing but whiskey. You eat different foods, but books are part of your life. And in 1972, um, I coached a basketball. In the early 70s, I coached a basketball team that was nationally ranked. It was one of the top basketball teams in the United States. The players were out of Brooklyn. Some of them may be watching now. They're all in their 60s now. <laughs> they were old. Uh, and Rick Talander, one of the top sport writers in the country, spent a summer with these kids when he was young uh, on the uh, basketball courts in Brooklyn. And he wrote a book called Heaven is a Playground. Okay. And he's, he and I spent a lot of time on the phone talking about my kids that were in the book. And I'm in the book. Mm -hmm. I'm in the book extensively. I thought that was pretty cool uh, when it came out. Um, and it had a li Library of Congress number. I bought a copy for my parents and, and signed it and gave it to them. And I said, here, we're in the Library of Congress, thinking I'd never write a book. Yeah. It just didn't think it was possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, who's going to get, you see all these movies about uh, 
people that write books and send in manuscripts and envelopes sure. and they get them back with big sexes on them <laughs> and they go out and kill themselves or something. And, and so my friend, Michael Samino, who's moved to this area six or seven years ago, uh, a year ago, December, um, came out with a book. Michael's a good friend. He's a New York City sommelier. He came to this area. He loved it. Uh, he's a tasting room manager at several wineries. Book and also available here. It's in also retail, available so. here. It's, yeah. Michael wrote a couple of books in New York City, and he, he put them together and called it a beginning guide uh, to wine. I, I, I read the book. I got it on Amazon. I called Michael. I said, great job, Michael. Who the hell published this for you? I said, how did you get a publisher? Right. He goes, you self-publish on Amazon. I said, explain that to me. He says, you send your manuscript into Amazon, and you have a, if they approve it, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I think they're looking for, if you write about nuclear codes or something, Sure. there must yeah. be some key words there. Finger Lakes wine <laughs> falls under the, it's okay, we'll let, you, we'll let that so slide. So the next day, actually the next day, Alex, I started writing. Now, you just don't, you gotta have information to write a book. Um, in You'd my, be surprised, but in this case, yes. Yeah, in my case. And during my, I'm, I've been here almost five years now, but in my first four years, in learning about wine, I put together a folder. I think you read this when, when you first came here. It was part of my, my um, homework when I and, started. And I wrote about, in research subjects, I've got acids in wine and malolactic fermentation, bottle wine. We did, mm -hmm. we did a whole talk on, mm -hmm. on, on last spring. Uh, bottle shock, cold stabilization, minerality, phylaxera, residual sugar, sulfites, tasting tannins, clones and mutations, noble rot. And I would post these articles for the staff and I, and I would learn as we were going. So I Working had, with uh, winemakers here at Wagner, right, correct, to help? Right, yeah. well, yeah. and of course, who I'm going to talk about in a second, um, had a great deal to do. She'd check this over and she'd go, good job, or I would change this a little bit. And I had all of this as a background. Mm -hmm. And then I had... Um, my personal research about how I pour wine differently. And we'll talk about that in a second also. Um, why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. For years, I would go into wineries, and even here when I started, and people would tell you and tell me on the wine trail what fruits I was tasting. Sure. You're going to get raspberries, strawberries, and blueberries. I didn't get any of that. And I liked the wine. I said, what's wrong with me? Then they would use words like full-bodied. You've all heard the term full-bodied, every one of you, when it comes to wine. Get out a sheet of paper, get a pen, and write me a definition. That's one of those terms. Oh, where do I start? Right. Minerality. That was going to be my next one. Yeah. Minerality. <laughs> We had a young man here, and he's, he was really good. He, he kind of trained me when I started, uh, showed me the ropes, and he would use that term constantly at his bar across from mine. And on many occasions, people would come over after their tasting and pull me aside and go, what is minerality? When is the last time you ate a rock you enjoyed? Enjoyed? Yeah, no. I don't use the term. I don't, and so there's many of these terms. I, I said, I've got to find a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And we had our first, our first talk last, uh, the end of last March, was about uh, the Bordeaux grapes. Right. When I researched the, all the background of where they came from, and that's what I tell people. If they like our wine, they're going to buy it. Yeah. They're not going to buy it because I tell them it's full-bodied or it tastes like raspberries. But if I tell them Cardinal Richelieu found the damn grape mm -hmm. in, in 1602 in the Basque region of France and brought it back, that seemed to catch a nerve. And I had all this research for my book. Well, and, you know, as you mentioned, with, with being a, a, a teacher, when I think back to who my influences were or my favorite teachers, they were those who could provide you the tools, provide you the history, mm -hmm. but then give you that space to reach your own conclusions, right? And, you know, I think that is what, uh, you know, I enjoy about tasting with you. What I enjoy about reading this book is you, you're going to learn a lot. And, I mean, I know we've had folks who 
already are trained in wine learn a lot from the from this book or from from tasting with you um, but but you're still able to kind of steer your own course uh, real quick just because folks are giving you shout outs and stuff I always like to intersperse okay. those because I know you like to hear you know who's checking in Victor Brutsky uh, John is a wealth of knowledge every time we've had him. He's been our server at least five times. <laughs> it is not, not uncommon to have folks request uh, to taste with Mr. Poulos. Um, we could spend the whole day listening to John, Katie Gaines with that, with that note. Um, and Marjorie San Pietro, I always enjoyed your articles previous to the book project and I love the additional recipes. I'm excited to receive my copy. Uh, yeah, and, and, and we, I know we'll get to it later, but a lot of recipes uh, well, fill this book as one, well. One of my lives was as, as a chef and owned a restaurant, and I developed a lot of recipes in my day. Some of them were recipes I found and I worked with. Some of them were my originals, and I paired every single one of our wines with a recipe in the mm -hmm. middle of the book. And, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our founder, Bill Wagner, was, and it's almost more of an old world style of thinking than it is than new world, but that wine should always be paired with food. Mm -hmm. uh, it was part of the reason behind the Ginny Lee Cafe being built uh, in the early 80s, and it's just great to see that legacy living on uh, in this book. All right, so I'm writing the book. It took me, it took me a year, um, and we'll get into more details later. But it's done. And I'm going to pass it on to my editor, who I'm going to talk about in a few minutes about editing, which was a whole new lesson for me, was, <laughs> was, was editing a book. That's like giving a tasting and then somebody giving you feedback. Yeah. And, that must have been hilarious. I um, wish there was a camera roll. Um, she, this isn't exactly what happened, but it's my recollection. And, and she did not I want... I believe we'll read in the comments. She if, did not want to um, read any of the sections. She wanted the whole book done. She wanted okay. everything to read it. She didn't want to edit it because she knew that when she started reading it, she wanted a certain flow. So she hadn't read any of it. And she called me here when, when she started editing it. And basically what she says, and I wanted her sitting here tonight, but she didn't want to come. She wanted to be in front of the camera. But basically what she said to me when she called says, do you want this to sound like you or do you want this to sound like a book? Mm. And I said, well, I kind of like it to sound like me. And Ann Rapido, our former winemaker of 36 years, world-class woman and a world-class winemaker, called me when she got the book and said, John, it's like having you in my living room reading to me. That's what she thought. And, that, it's, yeah. and people have said that to me. This is, this is you. And Donna edited the book to make it sound like I was in the room. Um, and then I had this, I said, I've read books. I've, you know, I'm not well read. I'm a lot better, more read than I was a couple years ago. But uh, dedication. Got to mm -hmm. have a dedication. That if part, not multiple dedications. No, 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 but that part was easy. It's yeah. my, my daughter. Right who uh, I've done a lot of great things in my life, and I've had a really good life, but she's the whole best part of my life. Mm -hmm. And so that was easy. I dedicated the book to my kid. And then there's acknowledgments. Yes. And I had a couple pages of acknowledgments. And the first mention were the Wagner family, you know, who not only brought me here, but they put up with me <laughs> and put up with my style and let me do what I want and knew I was writing the book, and, and, and they helped me, and they promoted me, and I would give them sections of it, and, you know, the whole, it's, you've been here how, how long now? Uh, about a year and two or three months, yeah. And I know you've worked other places and had other jobs, and I don't know if you work for family businesses, but this is a family business. Mm -hmm. you know, they're here every day. Yes. It, it's, it, their, their children are here every day. Mm -hmm. Their children are adults now, but they're here. It's a true family business, and they're really good people. And, and I, you know, I moved to Skinny Atlas, which is an hour drive, mm -hmm. and I drive an hour to work, and I've been offered other jobs. You know, I've, been, I've, been, I've had people from other wineries much closer to home where their people have come in and had me, and then they send their boss over, and he does a blind tasting, and then I get a phone call 
you want to come to work for me. I've had that happen on more than one occasion. And I drive here, because I, I think Alex, and it's in the book, I think I pour the best wine in the Finger Lakes from top to bottom. So I thank the Wagners, and we'll get more about just the way I wrote the book, you know, what wines I included. Um, and I, I mentioned Anne. Anne was instrumental in the appendix of the book and checking over the things that I did and, and giving me some, some help with, with some of these topics. Um, the people I work with, I'm 73 years old. I'm probably twice as old or more than everybody here. And I'm not as healthy. I mean, I've got a lot of energy. You've seen me. I've got oh, a lot yeah. of energy, but I got aches and pains. And these kids, I call them, I mean, they bring me water, they make my popcorn, they mop the floor, they, they go out of their way to make me feel you know, like their favorite grandfather. And that's what, uh, that's what I call them in the, um, um, in the acknowledgement. Um, the cover. Yes. The cover. I, the title, Looking at Wine Through a Different Window. And that, I knew what the title was from the beginning, before I wrote the book, because I pour wine differently than anyone else. And everybody says anybody in the region. So I wanted a picture of wine mm -hmm. looking in the window. And I couldn't find anything I liked. And then over the summer, Elizabeth Peterman from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, posted this to my, web book, my Facebook page. And she had been in a week or so before and bought Cabernet Franc. Now, it looks like a pencil sketch because I had a program that could change the photograph yeah. to a pencil sketch. And then I found a frame and put it around. And, but Elizabeth came to me two, three years ago with a bunch of her friends. She's a nurse. And her four friends, I think, all drank dry wine. And Elizabeth circled sweet wine. And you know. That is not, that's, that's a no-no when you go to taste. Well, yeah. Yes. He'll, he'll help educate. So I said, Elizabeth, I didn't know her name. I said, you're going to drink sophisticated wines today. You're, you're going to drink vanifera wines. And she looked at me like, OK. And I always pour our K wood first. And she goes, this is good. And over the course, now, to be fair to you few that may have had, if they don't like the K-Wood, mm -hmm. then they can have their sweet wine. Sure. But what, I normally test. but what I normally find is if they like the K-Wood, which is 0 0.3, 0 0.4 sugar, mm -hmm. but it's got that great fruit of a Riesling, mm -hmm. then I know that they can drink drier wines. Reds are a little bit different. Elizabeth, would turn, I turned her into a dry wine drinker. Mm -hmm. And the reds came a little later. Reds you do with food if you really want to learn how to drink reds. Exactly. And she became, so that's my cover. Yeah. That's my cover. Okay. And then finally is my editor. <laughs> and that's Donna Rose. I met Donna six years ago. We became, it says in the book, instant friends. Her kids adopted me into their family. Asher in his 30s and and Erica, uh, and Erica's husband, Johnny, and they had a little, little boy, Oliver, who's like two and a half now, uh, and they call me grandfather. And it's been a wonderful relationship um, with the whole family. Donna is a professional editor. She's not just somebody that Donna knows more about the English language, um, and she, she's probably watching, and you're going to get a nasty comment here in a second. but. Uh, an editor is not someone that just fixes punctuation and spelling. Yeah, an editor not a proofreader. Yeah. It's just not a proofreader. Yeah. An editor is someone that makes sure, and, and Donna's a wine drinker, but she's not a connoisseur. Donna judges wine on, on if she can open it and, and, and what the color is. And so she was learning as she was reading. And, and the good part about it is sometimes when you write and you know a lot about something, you assume everyone knows it. Mm -hmm. And she would catch those places where, you know, what does this mean? Sure. I don't know what this, and, and she was absolutely right. 
So I went through and reworked it with her. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would write, I'm a math major, for God's sakes. I'm not an English major. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I wrote choppy sentences, she would fix them. She would bring them together where the thought was still the same. And, and she's known me for six years and she knows how I think and how I talk. And, but she, she, did a, she, she did an incredible job. I want to read some. I'm going to take a minute here. Donna, uh, again, you're going to get something. Uh, is a summa cum, summa cum laude graduate from American University. Okay. I've sat on the board of trustees at Hobart and William Smith Colleges with the editor of New Yorker, with the chairman of Goldman Sachs, with some bright people. She's the brightest person I've ever known. So I have a section in here on Tannen. Yes. And as I reread it, I've always said Tannins, T A N N I S. Mm. And uh, you've read this. I know. I know. <laughs> Sorry. And, I'm trying to give it away. Okay. <laughs> and I noticed she took the S off the Tannins. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? Why did you do this? And this is what I got back from her. And I think I'm going to read I it. I see Look. the staple, so it might. Well, it won't. It, it won't. Go it's not that long. <laughs> it's big letters, so I can oh, read it. Fair, fair. Okay, but this is how a true editor thinks and works. And mm -hmm. then we'll talk about something else. <laughs> the the issue is using tenants for both singular and plural. If it is tannin as a singular, a wine can have more tannin or less tannin. The abuse of the English language is when people say less when they mean fewer. Examples. One citizen is an American. Two is Americans. 200 is more Americans. But if you go backwards from 200 Americans, it is incorrect to say less Americans. It's fewer Americans. So my brain gets agitated the thought of less tannins and fewer tannins Sounds bad, but too, but at least it is correct. Instead, think of water. You have more water or less water. But if you are talking about bottles of water, you might say, how many waters do you need? You would be talking about separate units of water. That's not what tannin is or tannins are. There is a uni if there is a uniform measure tannin, and she wrote with an S, in parentheses, you could have more or fewer of them. But if tannin is a description of an effect, it is still a singular thing. Higher tannin, okay. Lower tannin, okay. Higher tannins, marginally okay. Lower tannins, even less okay. <laughs> uh, of course, if there is a uniform measure of tannin, like cups of sugar, well, it would still be awkward to have less tannins. A plural of something is fewer, not less. A smaller quantity of something is less. Now your brain is probably exploding, as all of yours is, are. <laughs> now I remember the day when my mother hit me with fewer versus less. I was in junior high. I believe until Merriam-Webster changes the law, fewer and less are not interchangeable. That's an editor. That, that, that to a T. That that's, is, that's an editor. That's a good editor. And, and she is, she, the book is as good as it is because of her. All right. <laughs> as I mentioned, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall during some of these discussions, but I appreciate you sharing. And uh, don't worry, folks, there will be no uh, tests <laughs> no later, tester. as Donna says in the, in the chat, clear as mud, John. <laughs> oh, she wrote it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bob Smith says, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, see was that, no and, pain. That, and then I, I, I'm sure Donna's in the same vein as I am, where then when you see like the dictionary def choose to define the word irregardless because so many people say it, even though it's not a real word, uh, those are the things that will irk me to know. To, yeah. uh, and her, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and her, too. I mean, she could, she, you two could talk for, for ages. Um, and well, so my question is, how much thicker was this book prior to uh, Donna coming in and, and uh... Uh, no, <laughs> she's um, she, you know she rewarded a lot, not a lot, but you know she <laughs> concise things. It wasn't that much thicker. Uh, I was afraid it wasn't going to be a hundred pages, and she yeah. told me all along it's way more than a hundred pages. 
you know, I didn't, you know, it's 185 pages, which is a pretty good sized book, I think. And, and, you know, she picked the fonts out and things like that. And I just let her go with that. We had um, a discussion, a few discussions about how things were done, but usually I would defer to her. And, and I think one or two times, you know, she said, okay, but I would, I certainly can't argue with her about the English language. Sure. Let me, let me get off that subject and, and talk about um, the content of the book. I pour Wagner wines. Mm -hmm. I pour Riesling. I pour Gewürztraminer when we have it. Yeah, coming, I, coming back soon from okay. the bottle. I pour Chardonnay. I pour Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. That's what I pour. I don't pour Sangiovese. I don't pour Malbec. I don't pour Camonier. Mm -hmm. I don't pour Temperillo. Mm -hmm. I don't pour other vinifera grapes. I don't pour Zinfandel. Syrah. Syrah. I don't pour them. Okay. I don't pour Sauvignon Blanc. I don't pour Pinot Gris, which are very popular wines because we don't grow them. Mm -hmm. They're not in my book. The history of what we pour here. Now, I had a gentleman here, I'm guessing after we open, we're in August. And I, en I ended up, it was during the week, so I wasn't busy, and I got to spend quite a bit of time with him. And I knew something was up uh, because he was taking notes on everything he tasted. So I knew he's not a normal customer. And I finally asked him, you know, what are you doing? And he goes, Taking down secrets down. I'm a third level sommelier. And, I, and, and you two conversed. Mm -hmm. Remember, I gave you his yep, information. That's correct. Uh, I he, can vouch. He's a Penn State professor, he's a doctor, and he is the wine consultant at, I think it's City Winery in Pittsburgh. They, they bring in juice from all over and, and they make their wine there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing while I was writing the book and I had people that really seemed interested in, in me talking was um, I would offer them my manuscript or parts of it while I was doing it and I sent it to him. And he read it and he came back with some really nice comments. But he said, this is really, I knew, is, he was a third level sommelier mm -hmm. and I knew things he didn't know, mm -hmm. a lot of things he didn't know. Um, I, I certainly don't have the palate he had but he was very impressed with our wines, very impressed. And he was impressed with, you know, the things, you know, the, you know, the Merlot story and these other stories. Um, and he told me, he suggested that I don't just tune in on Wagner wines. Because mm -hmm. every one of these is I talk about our wine. I, got, I have two blends in here. Well, we've got the Fathom and the Meritage. That's the only two blends that are in there. Mm -hmm. And I gave a history of when blending wine started, but then I talked about the Fathom 107 and our Meritage, um, how we do our rosé. And it was just our wines. And he suggested this book could, he said, be more widely accepted if you kept it a little more general. Sure. I want to do that. It's, I, I work here, I'm happy here, and I thought it should have been about our wines. And we sell it in our bookstore, and it's doing pretty well. So. Yeah, we're on our second, uh, our second pressing, if you yeah. will, of, yeah. uh, of copies. Actually, the third pressing. Oh, okay. The third Fair. pressing, yeah. the third one, yeah. So, you know, that's, it's about our wine. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to find Pinot Gris in here, because we don't have it. We're not going to find Sauvignon Blanc, even though I mentioned Sauvignon Blanc, because it's half of... Uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. I, I, we're not going to find it here. You know, we're not going to find a description of that there. So that's basically the content of the history and the background. And for the people that have had me, you know, it's, you know, the history of the grapes. So we talked mm -hmm. about that again uh, during our conversations last year. And, and it's not just the history of the grapes either. It's the history of, of the region. Because I think so yep. much, so much of, um, you know, Riesling in particular, when we talk about not just not just the grape itself, the history of the grape, but why and how we're able to grow it here in upstate New York and 
you know, how much we really do owe to this beautiful lake that's and right that's, And that's really the first chapter of the book, right. is the history of the region, uh, why we're able to grow Riesling, and the pioneers, uh, you know, of the region. We go way back to 1825 when William Boswick, I don't know if you ever heard mm -hmm. about him until you read the book, but he came from Albany. Um, he came to Hammondsport. He started uh, the Episcopal Church in Hammondsport. And in Albany, he had a large plot of land where he, drew, he grew vegetables, but he grew grapes. He grew Concord and Isabella grapes, a couple of Native American grapes, Catawba he grew. And he came here, and one of his uh, parishioners gave him a tract of land near his church. And he went back to Albany, and he got cuttings, and he started growing grapes here. And by the time they were ready, around 18, and you got to remember, Alex, the other thing that was going on in 1825 was the Erie Canal opened. Mm -hmm. Now you could ship things across the street to the Hudson into New York City. It was huge. The, 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 the travesty, I mean, it took them from 1817 to 1825 to build the canal. And it was huge. But the, the, the sadness of it is the railroads came right after it so soon mm -hmm. that, you know, that it replaced the Erie Canal once they've got that done. But what happened was he started making wine. He made the real first recorded wine in this region around 1830. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to his church people. And, and I've read that his services, you know, increased, the numbers increased. <laughs> So the wine must have been pretty he good. He wasn't telling them what fruits they were tasting either. No, right? no I'm <laughs> guessing not. But he had an audience. And he told his weekly audience of a full house, take some cuttings of my grapes. I'll show you what to do. And then when he started making wine, he, people came to him. And that's really how the industry started in 1814. 1840 and 1850, we had places like Pleasant Valley that's still there, and the Taylor Wine Company, and the forerunners of Gold Seal, the Urbana mm -hmm. Wine Company, and Hammondsport became really the hub of, of, of this industry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until much later uh, that we had wineries. We were growing grapes for the wineries, but and they were all the, the Native American grapes that were easy to grow. Yeah, or French-American hybrid yes. grapes. Yes, uh, and those yeah. two, of course. But it was, uh, and, and we all know the story, of, for those of you that drink wine, of, of, of uh, Constantine Franck in, in Odessa, Russia, brought in Riesling and uh, brought in Riesling and Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and grafted cold weather sock to them and proved they could grow. And he came to America, went to work for Cornell, did the same thing, bought a track of land in Hammondsport, and proved that we could grow vinifera grapes. Mm -hmm. So when Bill Wagner, when they passed the Farm Wine Act in 1976, mm -hmm. and people knew it was going to get passed. It wasn't like they woke up one morning and saw the newspaper. Oh, my sure. God. It had been, there had been a it, lot building. There was a lot of it. talk. Yeah. And so Bill was ready to go, and he mm -hmm. started building this building. But he'd been growing grapes. Right. And he was a pioneer. One of our, one of our raising blocks was one of the oldest in the region. And they were pioneers. Gene Pierce at, at uh, Glenora, who's still alive, where they were there, and the Hazlitts were early pioneers. And they were the first three wineries. We were the second. We had this facility, which was like any other that was, was built. Um, it was bigger than, than the Pleasant Valleys and Golden Seals, Gold Seals in, in Hammondsport. Uh, he was, you know, Bill Wagner had great foresight. And uh, um, if he could see it now, it's just, you know, I, I used to give tours. Hopefully, we can do them again. Yeah. yeah. But the basement in an octagon building is full of barrels. We you know we've done our. Yep. We've done a tasting down there, and we've done special events down there. But there's there's five, six, seven hundred barrels down there. Yep. Surra and, surrounding a core of earth that helps. Yep. And, moderate and they're the cool. Temperature. Yep. You, you come here and it's hundred degrees in August, and you go downstairs and you want a sweater. Mm -hmm. And it's perfect for for aging wine. He had great foresight, and. And here we are today, the, the 2019 and practically 20 because of COVID, winery of the year. Um, yeah, we'll take that. 
Uh, we'll take that. <laughs> let me let me lean over here for a second. I did bring this out just in case. Well, I do also, uh, you know, want to tie it back in, kind of tie a bow on uh, when we're talking about the history with folks. Oh, we'll we'll get to that. Too. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not worth my PR medal if I don't bring yeah, that sure. up. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, but if folks come here uh, to taste, and you go out, you're in you're in our tasting room tasting with John. You go out on our back deck. Maybe you're enjoying uh, our fully now fully enclosed brew deck. Uh, and you look out towards Seneca Lake and you see vineyards, there's about 19 acres uh, on, on the route down to the water, there's a gap, a little gap, and that is where the railroad was. Yes. However, as you follow that gap toward the end of our vineyard, you'll, you'll start to see vines, and we have a Merlot block that's going to be about three years old, uh, and we do believe that that is the first, uh, those are the first grapes planted on the actual where the railroad was. Okay. Uh, because a lot of work had to go into, you know, making sure that that land was clear to, you know, establish a, a deep root system, as as John Wagner talks about. Mm -hmm. You know, you want you want upwards of four plus feet of soil without any uh, any barriers, so that the roots can 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 establish themselves. But uh, just always something that's interesting, and you know, knowing that there used to be a railroad right there, and. Things, things, well, things change. I, I've lived here long enough yeah. to know, to, to remember the railroads. And, and they would run through, um, you know, they would run through Montour Falls on Watkins Glen, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And they would run through that swamp area. And the sparks would, in the summer, start the swamp on fire. Mm. Uh, you know, the, that stretch between Watkins and Montour, and Montour is all yeah. swamp. Yep, yep. And the railroads would run constantly through there, three or four trains a day. And in my, if you've been to Montour Falls, you can see where the railroad used to go through there. The, 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 one of the doctor's offices there in Montour Falls is, 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 uh, was a railroad station. Mm -hmm. But as they went through the swamp area, and, and my former restaurant, Chef's Diner, was there, and there would be summers where the, the smoke would be so bad from those fires, and there was really nothing they could do with them because you can't get a fire truck out in the swamp, sure. and they would have to burn themselves out, and, mm -hmm. and the fires wouldn't. So I remember one year it came almost to our back door. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> but the railroads, would, with the sparks and the dryness, would start the fires. And so I remember the railroads. Uh, uh, they would come through, and, and the horns and the whistles, they would come through town a lot. So, you know, it, it's just an extension of that. So they were huge. Mm -hmm. They were huge in the day. Uh, just to ch wrap this up, the John, John <laughs> wanted to tout... Uh, Next, next month, uh, make sure you get your edition of Wine Enthusiast magazine, uh, which features uh, LeBron James on the cover, actually. Is he? Uh, yes, he is on the cover. Uh, we got our test uh, issue just in the mail, uh, and that is the You're edition. hiding it? I haven't seen it. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it down. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> uh, that is where uh, we scored a 93 uh, for our, our 2019 KWD, scored a 93 editor's choice, uh, the highest score that we've received in that publication before. We don't only ever want to talk about scores or anything like that, but, but certainly a wine that, that we know has great potential. So it's always great to see, uh, to see that wine get recognized, a wine that is available now as well. Uh, so you can go right ahead and buy that. Uh, <laughs> always, always great to see. And um, you know, a couple other Rieslings are, are, there's a really good section about the Finger Lakes in general. Uh, you'll see the K-Wood. You'll also see our dry Riesling and our semi-dry also okay. scored 90 Well, points. I had a dinner party last night, as I told you. Uh, ate too much of my own food. But we were drinking these wines on the table uh, and, and our Grace House Pinot is what we drank because when you come to my place to drink wine, we just drink Wagner wine. We there you go. There's no other wine to drink. <laughs> That's a good segue, though, because before we, before we start to touch upon your other projects, for which I know there are some, <laughs> Uh, if you've already bought this book, don't worry, you'll have, uh, there are more in the pipeline. Um, one last thing on this book, though, because we did mention the recipes. Uh, what, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I watch cooking shows, but I'm not well versed in the, in the kitchen. I mean, am I going to be able to, to uh, well, make some of these, I or do said, we need to I go to the said, culinary institute I, here? I always thought <coughs> my first book, if I wrote, excuse me, if I wrote a book, would be entitled and I still may write this book. If you can read, you can cook. Because I was going to write a cookbook that if you can read, mm -hmm. you can cook. There you go. And basically, that's what my recipes are like. Now, I, I copied and pasted. I think Donna's 
one of her biggest headaches with this, with, with the book and the cookbook part, was I copied and pasted recipes from my recipe online, not online, but my, my personal recipe thing. Sure. The fonts aren't all the same. Uh, 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 the, the styles aren't all mm -hmm. the same. And she put everything, I think it took her a long time. But what I did is, is I paired every single one of our wines with a recipe. And I put them in order. Um, buffalo meatballs. Okay, I'm listening. So you like... You like buffalo chicken wings. Yeah. Well, I do. Well, where I'm from, they're just called wings. <coughs> okay. Well, that's right. Nah. <laughs> that's right. All right. You're from Had buffalo. Had to get that in there. Had to get that in but there. But I, I made <clears throat> a meatball using chicken thigh meat that tastes just like chicken wings. Okay. And you dip them in the blue cheese and things. And if you think about the spiciness of them with our Fathom 107, oh, yeah. it, it's perfect with that. I'm a big Caesar salad guy. Okay. Um, Salads sometimes tough to pair. Yeah, you, you and, know, and, and a lot there, of trepidation. I got um, people out there that have had my Caesar salad that are probably listening. Uh, and I make a. Re I, I first had Caesar salad in the early 70s in Tijuana, Mexico, where they were invented at, at the hotel. And that was my first Caesar. That might be the most interesting thing I've learned so far. Okay, that's where they, yeah. that's where they invented. And. Uh, I make a great Caesar with dressing, and, 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 and my personal dressing is in here. Um, I'm Greek. My father loved Greek salads. If, if you've had a Greek salad, think about it with rosé. I paired it with rosé. It's perfect with that, with the cucumbers. Cabernet Franc, I paired with uh, beef short ribs. Okay. Uh, perfect with that. that. My short word recipe is about three pages. You have to read slowly, but uh, it, it, well, short ribs. But, know, it, but it's really it's all good. about an investment of time. And then uh, the beef tenderloin uh, with mushroom sauce. I paired with the Pinot Grace House, uh, and then I've got a separate. Mm. Uh, and then my favorite burger in the world. When I was at my restaurant, I had a burger of the week. Okay. And over the eight years or nine years that I did a burger of the week, I invented over 200 burgers. And I always plan on writing a book on burgers, too. And one of my favorite burgers is the Wine Country Burger with a Bernays mayonnaise and a red onion marmalade sauce. And I pair that with Cabernet Sauvignon. It's perfect with that. Uh, chicken France, my own style with a dry Riesling. Um, and, and then the, I can't even pronounce it, the, uh, the pork dish that I tried with the Gewürztraminer uh, from Europe. So maybe you don't even need to be able to read. To, uh, yeah. You know, or you don't need to be able to pronounce it. Crab cakes, which is my recipe with the K Wood East, and so on. Um, lobster with sparkling Riesling, and I, and I tell how to cook lobster two different ways. I've got a mussel recipe. These are all my personal recipes, and I have paired them with every one of our wines. And it's... Um, it was, it, was, it, was, it was very interesting to do that. <laughs> well, we're coming up on an hour. Johnny Mapley says, my favorite salad. Not sure if he's referencing Caesar or, uh, or Greek there, but uh, I'm, I'm going to guess Caesar. That, okay. sounds, that, yes. sounds, uh, that sounds pretty unique. Um, so, so what is next, sir? I know for, well, for those who, who might not have remembered, we did have a Titanic-themed dinner uh, where we paired wine with, with food that was served on the Titanic, and uh, because of your, your other passion, yeah, not just wine. Yeah. Um, 1997, as we talked about, if I'm sure people didn't take notes. I saw Titanic. Ah. I, I saw Titanic. I walked into my restaurant the next morning, and Nick Rubelow, who's no longer with us, sat at the end of the counter. And I said, Nick, I saw Titanic last night. It blew me away. And he goes to me, and it changed my life. You know, a local woman survived that. A woman from Watkins Glen, Elizabeth Barrett Rothschild, survived Titanic. She was on the same boat as Molly Brown. Uh, Titanic, the last food was served uh, on the 14th was the anniversary last week. You're a Facebook friend of mine, and I posted mm -hmm. pictures of her. Mm -hmm. And the next day, the actual lifeboat where pictures were taken. Um, I spent the next 15 years researching passengers of Titanic, doing Titanic dinner at my restaurant, 
uh, the 100th anniversary, I did a dinner at the Harbor Hotel that I planned for a year. The hotel was very gracious in using my recipes from the book Last Dinner on Titanic. We had 264 people from all over the United States there, all dressed in tuxedos and long gowns and hats. We had music, we had, we had an opera singer. Um, other than the birth of my daughter and meeting you, it was probably one of the best days of my life. <laughs> Hi, I'm, the, I'm glad to be on the list, John. <laughs> but uh, I've got tons of information about the ship. I've lectured, I've talked, um, and I'm writing a book about my Titanic experiences. I'm probably halfway through it, um, and that's my next book. And uh, so I'm working on that now, and uh, that'll be, well, Donna's going to, Donna's already said she would, uh, she would edit it uh, at least. I'm going to put you on the spot. Is there a title, a working title? or uh... Not really. Um, I was thinking of the same type of here because I, I see Titanic differently than most people do. I don't know yet. I was mm -hmm. thinking of looking at Titanic through a different window, but it's not a series yeah. or anything. So... People would think you're writing from the iceberg's perspective. I, I don't too. know. I, I haven't. No, I don't have a title yet. <laughs> no I, I don't have a title yet. Um, but knowing that I can get it published and enjoying writing as I do, and I think I'm going to have some downtime coming up soon uh, mm -hmm. where I'll be able to do some writing. Um, yeah, that's my next book. Excellent. Well, I, I speak and for by the way, by the way, yeah. We didn't talk much about well, this. Well, this was going to be my closing. By, so, by the way. I, real quick, John, I just want to call out, if anyone does have any, any questions for Mr. Poulos, now would be the time because we're going we're gonna to wrap up talking about uh, this magnificent wine coming from this magnificent vintage. So okay. as I mentioned, 2020, dry rosé. Uh, and 2020, and, and you know, we, we don't kid because it was a horrible year. Uh, with the COVID and, and other issues that we won't discuss here, it was an absolutely horrible year. Yeah. 2020 wines, I think, are going to be spectacular. They've shown that already. Um, this is a great, great, the rosé is a great summer wine. Get it while you can. I know we made a lot of it, but it's already selling very quickly. And the, and the way I like to talk about this, think about being on Seneca Lake or Skinny Atlas Lake or a body of water. In the bathtub. In the middle of August, 95 degrees, a few wispy clouds, a little wind blowing, steel drum music on your boat, oh. and three or four bottles of this mm -hmm. on ice. It just is. That's how I spend Wednesdays and Thursdays, by the way. Uh, it doesn't get better than that. Is there a Spotify playlist you're playing, or you, do you have the drum yourself? Oh uh, yes, yeah, no, there's, <laughs> there's 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 always special music. Yes, yes. but that's perfect summer, perfect mm -hmm. summer wine. Yeah, I I, I usually um, I should have brought one down with me because I have a couple bottles of the 19 left. The the only few we okay. we did not library any, but we have about. No, nine. we didn't library. No, no so. it's not great. It's not a great library. Well, so part of why we're holding on to about 10 bottles, we do want to go back and revisit, because Rosé, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, Riesling wasn't considered age-worthy, and we're finding out now, uh, it is extremely age-worthy yeah. here in the Finger Lakes. Maybe Rosé can go down okay. that route, so we're holding on to some. Well, there's but no the, reason for it not to be, but people just don't buy old Rosé. You don't think about it, because we're selling freshness, as, right. as you right. so eloquently mentioned. Right. But the, the difference in color between the 19 and the 20, now 19 uh, was a beautiful growing season for a couple different varieties, yep. especially aromatic whites, very cool nights. Uh, the acidity really stood out, right. as it did in the 19 Rosé. This is a much darker color, much riper grape when we picked it, and you just get, like I describe it as, as biting into one of those strawberries where the juices start I, I would just think, you know, I don't use fruit uh, to I, I, No, I, no, I, I, but I, what I was saying is I was thinking the yeah. same thing. Yeah. I was thinking strawberry. If you don't taste strawberries, I would never tell anybody you're going to taste strawberries. Yeah. You know, every, and I don't really ask the questions, what fruit are you tasting? Because I don't want to embarrass somebody right. because somebody may like it, but they can't think of the fruit that they're tasting. But that's strawberries, and yeah. it's really, really good. It's, uh, it's a phenomenal wine. It's still, it's still a relatively young wine. Uh, and you are correct, though, in terms of we did, we up production a little bit. 
But uh, in perspective, I mean, we sold out of the 19 about early September of yeah, last year. Yeah. Um, we're, we're thinking we're, you know, it's not lasting too much longer past that. But funny you did mention um, uh, about descriptors and how they can, they themselves are almost a gatekeeper in some ways because people will read them and just get blown away. We yeah, but, yeah. Give me this. So, so this this <laughs> review from from Alexander Pear Tree uh, at the Wine Enthusiast, I feel is very uh, is is helpful. Uh, there was another review, and I won't name the publication, that mentioned soursop when talking about R. K. Wood East, and still gave it a nice score. But if you don't know, I mean soursop. I had to search Wegmans for for weeks till I could finally get something even resembling what a soursop is. It's it's very interesting. I think um, you know there's there's a lot of descriptors that, you know, it's, it's on us to, to broaden what we eat and what we experience and what we taste to help with. But then there are other times where it's just, you know, what, what are we really even trying to say here? All right. <laughs> so I'm going to read not from the beginning sentence, and he mentions peach blossoms. Nothing wrong with that. Um, bright shots of lime, grapefruit, lemon, meat with a juicy apple core. You know, this is a professional guy. Uh, on the dry pad, it leading to a gently creaming texture on the lingering finish. That's all understandable. The first couple, for me, mm -hmm. you know, I laugh at. Intensely coiled aromas of fresh lime. Mm -hmm. What's intensely coiled? Well, uh, I mean, I, I think what, what he's describing is a, is a youngish wine. It mm -hmm. takes a little bit of time to open up. It's open to I'm sure everybody. I'm sure everybody thinks the it's same sure. thing, Alex. Yeah. And then the next one, of course, you know, yeah. crushed stone. Right. When's the last time any of you had a mouthful of crushed stone? And if you have, then use it to compare a wine to. But if you don't have a lot of crushed stone in your mouth a lot, find something else. That's just me. Sure, <laughs> sure. I wrote a whole book about that. <laughs> um, a uh, uh, comment from Kevin Hoover, glad they got you off that bench in the vineyard, uh, and thanks for your knowledge. Uh, Kevin Hoover is, uh, believe, from Watertown. I think you're the right, Kevin. Owns a, uh, uh, a nice little bistro there, uh, a, a, like a little wine club, and he was here, uh, I believe, with his wife, um, and we did a really nice tasting together, and um, he's got our wines there. He brings some of our wines in. And uh, he's been a good Facebook friend. He's a, they're really nice people. Um, yeah. Well, sir, we, we, have did, come we, up, did it. we have come up on an hour. Um, if anyone had, does have any last questions or comments in, now would be the time to filter them. Um, but uh, oh, you don't have any wine in your glass, so I was going to give you a cheers. Oh, but, um, well, we so can, you might have to remedy, well, well, we can take to remedy that. that. Yeah, we can take care um, of that. While, while, while John uh, refills, I will give everybody just the quick rundown of where things stand right now with Wagner. Uh, I am so thrilled to be on a Facebook Live talking about us being open. Mm -hmm. As John mentioned, reservations for indoor tastings. Uh, and and they're, they're going phenomenally. You can book right through our website, up to six people. If you do not, uh, you know, if, if you don't know when you'll be here, you want to have a more relaxed experience, you just c come here more on a whim, or we are booked up, you can still come through. Uh, we're doing wine by the flights, by the uh, glass, oh, by the bottle. Tell, tell them about the new the setting out on the, yeah. on the deck. We're, 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 we're taking them on a journey here. So okay. you get your flight and you want to go out on the deck, but oh, what is that, rain in the forecast? Or a snow. squall, or a squall snow. coming through. <laughs> uh, we have completely outfitted, I say we, uh, <laughs> Mike, Michael John Drew, who it is his birthday today. Yeah. If everyone can, if you know Mike, please give him a shout out. Uh, this has been his, his project for, for a while now, outfitting our back, um, our back deck with gr sliding garage doors that are completely glass. So even when they are down and it is a tough weather, you can still see the beautiful view, uh, assuming your snow is not blocking your view. Uh, you can still see the sunset. We have radiant heat panels at the top that will still keep you warm. Um, you know, just expanding the indoor space that we have here. All new furniture, for God's sake. All sakes. new furniture coming through. So we'll be getting the, the picnic tables out, smaller tables, so that we can fit more people. It's a little bit, you know, those who you come with, it's a little bit more of an intimate setting. We'll still have the picnic tables out on the deck. You can come, or out on the lawn. You know, you can come and, and stretch out when the weather's nice and enjoy yourself. We will have uh, our, our music series starting at the end of May. 
Uh, it's going to be more of the acoustic style, but we'll still have food working in conjunction with the cafe. Cafe goes seven days a week, uh, starting May 1st as and well. And they had, they had different food items last year for the first time in many years, and it was, yeah. you know, different choices. It was uh, pretty spectacular. Yeah, yeah great, great to pair with not just Wagner Vineyards, but of course, Wagner right. Valley Brewing Company. One thing I did look up, too, uh, you mentioned the, the Farm Winery Act uh, of 1976. So this year is the 45th anniversary. Mm -hmm. June 4th seems to be about the uh, agreed upon day in which it was enacted. So uh, that's something we might we might plan a little special something for that day as well. Uh, so stay tuned. But I guess it, it all depends on, you know, the course this virus takes when things can maybe be yeah, we're, we're not exactly calling the shots in some no, respects, we're not. right? We're not calling the shots, but we're a whole lot better off than we were a year ago. Sure. When you yeah. and I sat here wondering, would we ever open again, for God's sakes? Or would there be another shutdown? Would there or, be another yeah. shutdown? And uh, uh, I have both of my shots. Um, um, Same. I, I, this, and I think most of us have. And it's and I and I say, you know, I hate to get political, but and I won't, but I will. You haven't really heard of anyone on the news that's had both shots, waited two weeks, that's gotten COVID mm. and gotten sick. Uh, and get your shots and we take our mask off and get back to normal. Um, it's, uh, and we're, we're getting there slowly, but mm -hmm. the state of New York still says, if you come here and you stand, you'll wear a mask. Yeah. And uh, even if you've had your two shots, Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we've got a ways to go yet. Well, I wanted to give you it's a always cheer, a pleasure. Sir, of course. Hopefully, it's not a year before we see each other again. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we, you know where you know where my office no, I, is. I know I, where I, your I, office I, yeah, is. You know where I am. Okay. And I would encourage for the you know one more time, looking at wine through a different window. If you haven't purchased it yet, it's available on our website. It's available here. If you have purchased, find this gentleman. He'll, maybe he'll... Well, uh, and if, and if I could add, um, my editor, Donna, suggests, and, and, and it does help book sales, if you read the book and if you like, if you didn't like it, just pretend you never got it. But if you, if you read the book and like it, go to Amazon and write a review. It, it, they're really helpful. The more reviews you get, the better off people like it. And I would say buy the, yeah, buy the book from our website, then go to Amazon and right. write the review. Get this guy on the what bestseller is list. What is it? The merchandise section? You go to... Uh, so where you sell wine or buy wine, you click down, it says merchandise. Yeah, it's, and you gifts. Go, to the, go to the shop tab. Okay. There'll be the shop wines underneath that, shop merchandise and gifts. It's the, the first one there. Also, a lot of, you know, uh, pieces from our retail store, shirt, uh, sweaters, shirts, glasses, things like that, you can also buy there. Right. But first and foremost, this is the And we have, a, we have a staff first thing in the morning. They check the computer, and the, when it's there, it goes out that day, so... And shipping is included in that. Shipping is included in the book. Shipping and the, and, and, and the tax, I believe, are yep. included. Yep, so. so that'll be the rate that you pay there that you see. So, so. thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Of it's, course, if, you, if, you've, if you've tasted with John before on one of these or you've watched one of these, keep, to, keep leaving your comments throughout. Right, uh, I, John will be I answer all of them. John will be revisiting the comment section later. So don't feel if you're watching this on replay, you did not you know, miss your opportunity to impart some words uh, to Mr. Poulos, who we are ever so thankful for uh, being here and a member of our team. Well, and I can say the same thing for you, because uh, you, you, what I've known, I've been here five years. You haven't been here five years. I've not been here five years. But Alex has done an incredible job of getting the Wagner name. Not that the wines haven't always been good, but it's not easy to do what you do and contact the right people and, and make the contacts mm -hmm. you do and have the personality you do to, it, it, you can laugh all you want, I, but to get the wine and get the Wagner story out there so people taste our wine and go, oh my God, that's really, mm -hmm. really good. And, yeah. And, I mean, and you've done a great job with thank that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, as I like to say, I mean, my job's easy because the wine is so <laughs> good, right? And that's why so, I drive an hour to I, work. I every can day. show up to, uh, I can go to talk to folks and be like, "What have What have you been missing? You've been a, you, you've been in the business forever." And yeah, you've, yeah. So no, um, it it all comes down to the great the great wine, the great care that goes into uh, every aspect of, of Wagner Vineyards, Wagner Valley Brewing, and the Gene Lee Cafe yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's all family. Perfect capper. Cheers to everybody out there Thank you. as well. We'll be back at some point. 
until then, everybody take care, and uh, hopefully you. we see you soon. Yep.